here to listen to the Italian wine ambassador herself, Petra Bellini. Let's head into the wine room, Khadija, and let's make it happen. Hi, everybody. Oh, I almost want to cry. Welcome to the last session of our wine course. And uh, yeah, as Wendy said, reminding you what we're doing today as a start. So as he said, we're, going, we're, we're taking you to the islands. So the two main islands that are part of Italy, Sicilia and Sardinia. And the wines ready if you want to show a second. So those who are already online can start getting ready. That we're doing today, it's Vermentino di Gallura Superiore. I'm curious to know how many of you remember what Superiore means on a label. Uh, from Sardinia. So that's our wine for uh, Sardinia. And then we're gonna try the Nero Davola, Nero Sbleo by Gulfi, and that's gonna be our Sicilian wine, okay? So make sure they're both uh, ready to go and open. In the meantime, while we wait, we should do a little bit, Randy, of a cruise, cruise around on our bottle. So I prepare a little bit of a selection about Sicilian and Sardinia wines. We, uh, we've always been big fan of uh, Sicilian wines. So there you see Etna wines, you see, ah, scared me, sorry. You see more Nero Davola, you see um, Frappato, uh, Cerasuolo di Vittoria, you see Cos, that's another Contrada Nero Davola. You see, there's a Cerasuolo, another Nero Davola from Firriato that we love too. Uh, then you got some Sardinia wines. You got a Canno now, which is Grenache. Uh, we got Lupus in Fabula, another great, great Vermentino di Gallura. Uh, ciao Nina, if you're there, uh, this is from Nina di OCG Imports. Uh, possibly the uh, go-to uh, Vermentino di Gallura in Sardinia. It's really, really well known among locals. Uh, very, very respected. 100% uh, female ownership, winemaking, yeah. etc. And great friend. So yeah, check out the DOCG imports online. You can definitely also order, order online and she does free delivery to your, uh, to your door. So check it out. Meza, another uh, famous producer from uh, Sardinia for another example of Vermentino. And then let's not forget this little guy in the middle. Unfortunately, I didn't have any other Donna Fugata wines. I wanted to display more because their labels are all pieces of art. And I encourage you to go on their website, Donna Fugata. And this is their Passito di Pantelleria. It's a dessert wine made with a passimento style, passito. Remember, we talked about it for Amarone in Veneto. So same, same kind of production, completely different region. You're on the island of Pantelleria, which is here. So here's our map to show you where the islands are. Sicily in red, and this one that I colored in blue is Sardinia. Pantelleria would be pretty much here, like in between Sicily and North Africa, okay? Uh, very, very special production. I don't know if we're going to have the time to cover Passito di Pantelleria, etc., and the island of Pantelleria today, but definitely something that if you're curious about, you should read uh, more. Well, I think we're going to get going, okay? And I'm going to start from Sardinia because I was thinking today maybe we start from Sardinia, we try the Vermentino when we have fresh in our mind what I've been possibly telling you about the soil and the area where the best Vermentino come from. Then we're gonna move to Sicily and try the red wine. So maybe today the flow for our next class will be a little bit different. Okay, starting from Sardinia. Sardinia is the second largest uh, island on the Mediterranean uh, Sea. As you saw, it's right south of Corsica. Uh, how do you say Corsica in English, Randy? Um, Corsica. Corsica, okay, yeah. so it is the same name, okay. Uh, it's, it's a very, very ancient geological formation. The soil of the Sardinia, that by the way, consider southern part of Italy has no volcanoes, which is kind of a rarity almost for southern Italy, because of the block of land that detached from the main peninsula. So from, if you think about it, kind of Liguria, France, Spain, uh, that's kind of where it was attached. Uh, there's absolutely no volcanic soil. There is a lot of granite, which is actually very, very rare uh, in terms of kind of soil for Italy. And that's mostly in the area where we make Vermentino di Gallura. Vermentino really, really likes that kind of uh, very, very dry and uh, unfertile soil. Uh, and then you find also a lot of limestone, clay, but no volcanic matter. And I'm mentioning that because we talked a lot about volcanic soil last week. Of course, Mediterranean climate, of course, lots of winds that come from all the directions, same thing for Sicily. 
Uh, the, the vineyards are mostly located on the coastal area, not a lot in the inland. So most of the wines produced in Sardinia definitely have a lot of uh, influence that come from the sea and the winds that are coming from the sea around it. Um, it is definitely a high quality production. I'd say that uh, you definitely find a lot of great, great uh, wines in, Sar in Sardinia, which is also very rich of uh, native varieties. Uh, okay, native, yeah, most likely brought there from the Spanish at a certain point, the majority of them, but they've been there for centuries and centuries. So they're, you can consider them now as autochthon of uh, Sardinia because they've been there forever, among which Vermentino or Cannonau, uh, which is the equivalent of Grenache, Bovale, um, what other important grapes? Let me get there. That I may forget. The Nuragus, very uh, Nuragus actually could be the only real native variety, white variety of Sardinia, because again, Vermentino has origins that uh, are a little bit unknown. We still don't know if it started from Sardinia and went to Spain, if it started from Spain and came to uh, Sardinia. Uh, maybe one day we'll find out where the truth is. Then they have uh, Vernaccia di Oristano, very, very particular wine. You don't find a lot of uh, Vernaccia di Oristano in the States, but if you do find it, I encourage you to try it. Very, very small production. As per reds, we have again, as I said, Canonao, Monica, which is native of uh, Sardinia, Bovale Carignano, which is the equivalent of Carignan, mostly planted in the southern west part of the island that's called Sulcis. So Carignano del Sulcis would be the most uh, famous Carignan produced in Sardinia, made mostly in very sandy soil, again close to the coast. I mean, you'd see these, the vineyards pretty much almost get to the sea. And then the, uh, the very important thing about this area is that there's a lot, a big concentration of Prefiloxera vines and very, very old vines. We talked about this. Prefiloxera doesn't like high altitudes, doesn't like volcanic soil, doesn't like sandy soil. So all varieties that were grown on this kind of soils kind of uh, develop a resistance to the uh, to 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 phylloxera. Um, Niedera is another uh, um, important native variety. So, but the most important, the two grapes of Sardinia are Vermentino for the white, specifically Vermentino di Gallura, which is the only DOCG for Sardinia. So just the Vermentino produced up here, sorry, that was Corsica, up here in the north, uh, kind of eastern part of the island. That's where Gallura is, okay? And that's where the Vermentino found is a special place. Thinking about wines that we spoke about in, in previous classes, it would be like Sangiovese with Montalcino. So that's where Vermentino expresses itself the best. Now, let's some fun facts about Vermentino, because it wouldn't be Italy and Italian appellations and Italian wines without something like that. Does anybody know if Vermentino, where Vermentino is grown, for example, besides Sardinia, which would be the other regions where we find Vermentino? Beyond clever, don't answer. Let other people answer. So other regions where you find Vermentino. You probably have to restrict Lisa too. Oh, and Lisa. So we have it in Sardinia. Let's see if we if we mention another region. Otherwise, I'm going. I see Marco's on. Marco should answer. Yeah. Well, we have it in Tuscany. Lots of Vermentino. Uh, mostly on the coastal area, Bulgari, where we produce super Toscans. But now you find it also in the Chianti area. And with a lot more attention than before to make mono varietal uh, Vermentino like in Sardinia. Before they used to blend it a lot with either Viognier or Sauvignon Blanc, and this tendency is now changing because producers, uh, winemakers, are now realizing the high quality of Vermentino. So it can be made in a lot of different styles. And if you know what you're doing and you're uh, you're doing your good good diligent job in the vineyards and then in the cellar, you can make outstanding wines from a Vermentino grape. So in Tuscany we have it and we call it Vermentino, and then we have it in Liguria. But in Liguria, dependently on when you, where you are, somebody calls it Pigato, P-I-G-A-T-O. Somebody calls it Vermentino. On the western side, normally Pigato. On the eastern side of Liguria, normally uh, Vermentino, where it's closer to Toscany. And then in Piemonte, we also produce it there a little bit, and it's called Favorita. 
So there you go. Again, three names, same morphologically identical grape, even though still today in our national registry, they are listed as separate varieties, okay? But now with the uh, uh, ampelology uh, applied to the studies of the DNA, we know that they're identical. Now, if I am telling you that, and that's why you now read in books, but if you talk to producers mostly in Liguria or also in Piemonte, they're gonna disagree many times with you and say, no, it's not true. Pigato is pigato, vermentino is vermentino. And to be perfectly honest, when you taste them side by side, even when you look at the bunch and the variety itself, they are incredibly different. So this is what you can call, um, Somebody called them eco-biotypes, meaning that they're even more uh, susceptible to the terroir where they're planted. So they really, really change a lot. In fact, there's really no, it's hard in a blind tasting, you would probably not easily say that if you have a Pigato, a Favorita and a Vermentino next to each other, that they're all the same grape. You will really find a lot of variation among the three. I'd say it's time to focus though on the Vermentino we have. Uh, and uh, possibly give you a little bit of general information about Vermentino and what you normally see and smell and taste in it. Uh, so, uh, it, again, it's a uh, well, color, you can look at that, but normally it's always gonna be like light straw yellow. That's kind of the color you're normally gonna find in Vermentino, unless it's, for example, a Vermentino made with a late harvest uh, uh, method, which is done quite often, then of course the color would be a little bit darker than this. In terms of aromas, uh, you find in Vermentino, Mediterranean herbs, stone fruits of different kind, uh, bitter almond finish, but we're not there to taste yet. Uh, and uh, let me see if there's something else. I had it down here at the end, uh, some other. Hi everybody, we may have had some, I'm not sure what happened. We might've had a technical difficulty there, but now we're back, no idea what happened. Petra, so, take it away. Yes. So we're going back to talk to Vermentino. Uh, other uh, aromas and flavors <laughs> that you often can find in Vermentino are like musky aromatics, and I do find some of those in this one. White flowers, like acacia, acacia flowers, other spices, but mostly again Mediterranean herbs such as rosemary, thyme, then citrus notes you can find. I, I said stone fruit, so of course peach, apricot, apple, um, or tropical fruits, which I think uh, it's kind of the direction where this Vermentino is going. Another typical characteristic of Vermentino, mostly the Gallura, is salinity. Of course, it's very, very coastal. Even if this one, just so you know, was reading where they are located, this would be one of the Vermentino produced a little bit. Okay, Petra, we're back. Oh, we're back. Sorry, For those guys. of you who can hear us, we don't have any idea what's going on. Um, we have great internet. We've never had this problem before, but we paused twice for some reason. I think the other regions are mad you're talking about Sicily and Sardinia. Maybe. So. That's, that might be the reason. I think the reason of Puglia is stopping us. Anyway, so I kind of done telling you uh, about the organoleptic characteristic of Vermentino. Unless you have any uh, specific uh, questions, I'd say let's keep taste this. Uh, other information about this specific one, Giancara, uh, it is, um, again, a little bit inland, about 300 meters elevation. It is all uh, stayed and steel, just so you know, it doesn't see any oak, also in this case. Definitely there's some, to me, other lease, extend lease contact or malolactic. I can feel that a little bit, but I'm not sure because I wasn't able to find, yeah, it doesn't say, it doesn't say if there's any of that, but I, I, I personally, feel the roundness in my mouth that makes me think there is. And I think what, what I, when I left you, the, the video pause, uh, what the, the main most important characteristic of Vermentino are the salinity. So this uh, sensation, like for example, we had in the Verdicchio de Castelli di Iesi that we tried not too long ago for the region of Marche. They have this similarity, this sensation of air spray, this, uh, this salinity and minerality. The soil of Gallura, the granite soil, of course, uh, produce wines that are very rich in minerals. Now, let's smell it and taste it. Yeah, I do feel myself that it goes a little bit toward the apricot, apricot and um, tropical fruits. Don't know if you agree with me.
the bitter finish, the almonds, definitely there. I don't know, does anybody want to add something more about this vermentino or you're curious about something else? Otherwise, I'm gonna take my boat and slowly make it down to Sicily. Ready for that? Okay, Sicily it is. So if we were in the second largest island of the Mediterranean, we are now going to the biggest island of the Mediterranean. Um, Sicily is, uh, I would say, a small United States of America. If you want to found the best example of a melting pot in Italy, that would be Sicily because of all the people that through the centuries have actually uh, um, took control over the island. Uh, going back to my slides here, not to forget any important, very important people that made their way to Sicily, but to give you to give you a little bit of a breakdown, 1500 BC, you got the Phoenicians there. 1800 BC, you got the Greeks. 200 BC, the Romans arrived. Then the Normans. And then 600 AD, you have the Arabs that definitely influenced a lot of the culture, language, food, you name it, uh, of, uh, of Italy, of Sicily. Many names of the cities there and also some wine varietals are actually inspired uh, by uh, Arabic names. Now, uh, Sicily as um, Sardinia is really influenced by winds and many, many kind of different soils and microclimates. It is really, you, um, it is one of the most diverse regions in Italy, if not the most diverse. You, 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 went from, you go from one area to the other and you find completely a huge soil variation, huge microclimate variation, difference in the winds that, uh, that come toward mostly what I wanted to talk because we were, we were mentioning Pantelleria, which is uh, right here. So Pantelleria is subject to a specific uh, wind that's called Scirocco that comes right from Africa, from the desert. In a way, you can consider there like our Sanana, super hot wind that comes from Africa that can actually cook the grapes. So I'm encouraging you to go in your Google and to type Pantelleria and look at the technique that they use to actually protect, protect the vines. They actually make holes in the land. The vine is inside an hole. All you see is like the, the super aerial leafage, but the grapes and everything else are inside an hole to be protected from this wind that otherwise will completely cook the grapes before harvest time. So very, very cool to watch. So if you can, Google Pantelleria vineyards and look at that. And also look at those beautiful black rocks, which is what they use to dry uh, the grapes before they press it to make the passito. Remember, for Amarone, they actually do it on straw mats inside the winery, very aerated area, because there's always the risk of rain. Pantelleria, not so much. Since they're not afraid of the rain coming anytime soon, they can easily dry out the grapes outdoor, and many producers do. Um, okay, let's get to the main grapes of Sicily, and then let's talk about what we're trying today. So in terms of the white grapes, you have uh, native varieties as in Solia, Grillo, Cataratto, which is the most planted grape in Sicily. You would think that it's Nero Davola, but it's not. It's actually Cataratto. Uh, then you have Zivibbo, which is uh, the actual real name uh, for Moscato di Alessandria. But if you look at our registry, it's uh, the, the name that is recorded with, it's Zivibbo. Then you have on the eastern part, northeastern part, Carricante, the main grape, white grape on Mount Etna. Uh, and uh, Minella, but I think those are the most important ones. As per red, Nero Davola second most planted uh, grape in Sicily after Cataratto, which is the grape of Sicily. But curiously enough, the name in the National Registry, once again, it's not Nero Davola, it's Calabrese. So the actual grape is recorded as Calabrese. It, it turned into Nero Davola through the years because uh, Italians tend to use the word Nero associated with uh, many red grapes that have actually a darker color. And then most of the times they associate that with the area where the grape is from. So Nero Davola means the dark, uh, the dark colored grape coming from the little town of Avola, which is in the southwestern part of Sicily. Okay? So Calabrese, real name, Nero Davola, the actual name that the varietal is known for all over the world. 
Beside Nero Davola, we have his favorite blending partner, which is, who wants to tell me what is Nero Davola's favorite blending partner? Let's see. Three, two, one. Frappato. So you're gonna find Nero Davola blend with anything possible out there. But while blending Nero Davola with Syrah, Merlot, Cabernet, uh, it kind of simply takes away the typical characteristic of Nero Davola and creates a wine that if you ask me, it's pretty anonymous. When you blend it with Frappato, you have like the perfect match. You get a, a, a deep, uh, kind of structured variety and wine that comes from Nero Davola and you add the freshness, the aromatics, the, uh, the more spiked acidity of Frappato and you have uh, an outstanding blend which is the blend in Cerasuolo di Vittoria, okay? So Cerasuolo di Vittoria, it's always a blend of Nero Davola and Frappato and it's the only one DOCG made in Sicily, okay? So very important wine. I guess, uh, yeah, the other important grapes, just little important to mention, Mount Etna. So the eastern part of, uh, northeastern part of the island is dominated by Mount Etna. I think most of you know that Mount Etna is the highest and uh, biggest active volcano in all Europe still active. I was there just uh, in October of 2019. It was my first time. And I think it was one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen to see this uh, La Montagna. That's how they call them, the mountain. Like it's, a, it's, it's an entity. It's not just a mountain there. For the locals, it's something that they look at as something alive and be really, really, truly part of their life. So definitely if you haven't gone to Sicily, go and make sure you take some time to go look at the area around Mount Etna where delicious, amazing wines come from. Again, Etna Russo and Etna Bianco that we uh, previously showed you over there. But today, for the one that we're trying, the Nero Davola, we actually go southeast of the, uh, of the region, southern of Catania, near the area called Noto. This is considered to be in theory, the best area for production of Nero Davola, but you find beautiful Nero Davola from everywhere in the region. Just a very different expression because the soil is that different. Now, Gulfi is the one and only producer that believes uh, in, in, in this huge change vineyard to vineyard for also Nero Davola production. There hasn't been anybody before Gulfi talking about MGAs or crews of Nero Davola. They're the first one and only one who actually still today do it. Now, the, the Nero Jubileo, the one that we're gonna try today, it's actually a blend of different vineyards that they own. But then, Randy, if you wanna show them again, the Nero Baroni, that one, they do at least four or five different single vineyards uh, in the area closer to Pachino. I'm gonna write down this name from you because if you find Nero Davola coming from this area, in theory, you are drinking the Nero Davola from the best crew for this grape. Not the pa. pa. And while you're writing, so you can think about it, there's just a question of, do you smell more sulfur in the wines because of the volcanic grounds and, and you know the background volcanic nature of the terroir? You're talking about the Nero Davola? I believe that's yeah, what because we said not she or he's here. talking about. Yep. So uh, in theory, down here. Okay, everybody, we seem to be back again. I don't know. Um, hopefully, you can hear us now. We did have power outages all day here in San Diego. It came back about an hour and a half ago. We may have Maybe that. there's something. I doubt it. But anyways, but we are back. We are back. So somebody was asking about sulfur notes. Um, uh, if you do smell those, there might be a little bit, instead of sulfur from the soil, uh, because again, there's really not much volcanic matter there, except for possibly ashes that made it all the way down there from Mount Etna. Uh, because as far as I remember, there are no active, definitely not active, but I'm not sure if there's any extinct volcano down there. I do not think so. We have to check that for you. Uh, yeah, so we are in this area, just so you know, down here, very south, while Mount Etna is up here, okay? 
but uh, it, it's because it's a wine from the south, from a very, very um, warm area, I wouldn't exclude that what you were smelling could have been a little bit of reduction in the wine. This is a 2017 that was actually also very dry and hot here. So it's uh, grapes like uh, Nero Davola, Primitivo, in some cases, some of the ones are more prone to reduction, which is this, this nose that actually reminds you of sulfur, but normally it kind of resolves quite easily. As soon as you let the bottle aerate a bit, this kind of reduction should go. Yes. And there's also a question from Lori, mm -hmm. who joined our really fun um, Piemonte winemaker dinner, winemaker lunch on Saturday. She's asking a great question. Um, she's wondering what are the typical foods for each of the islands. So oh, you may want to answer yeah. it now or in a few minutes, but yes, she would yes. like to know that before we're done. Yeah, no, no, I can. Uh, you, you have fun smell the Nero Davola while I talk, so then we smell it and taste it together. Today the life will probably go a little bit longer because we had all that those interruption. But sorry, I forgot to mention some of the foods from Sardinia. Uh, so the first things that I want to say is Malloreddus, also known as gnocchetti sardi, the little pasta that or conchiglie. There's many names used for that pasta, but very very famous. Bottarga, which is dry mullet eggs that you actually grate on your pasta like you would do with parmesan, just a little bit that adds this beautiful flavor and saltiness. Then, of course, seafood and crustaceous. Uh, crustaceous, is that right? Crustaceous. And then, um, of course, pork-based, a lot of pork in Sardinia. Porceddu, which is the pork that they cook in the underneath the earth. They make an oil and then they cook it there. Um, the pane carazau, also known as pane musica because of the noise musica from music, the noise that it makes, it's very crunchy and thin. It's, uh, it's like, you're probably familiar with matzah, similar to matzah. Definitely, it's a non-rice um, non bread, there's no yeast in it. And then the formaggio marcio. Uh, formaggio marcio is a cheese that actually comes with bugs in it. Uh, it is delicious. I know it sounds very weird, but don't tell that to somebody from Sardinia because they're gonna take offense by it. But it's actually cheese where you're gonna see little bugs, and you should probably type this. Too. Okay, no one's asked yet, but what kind of bugs, if we could uh, ask? The wor worms. 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 Oh, okay. The, so let me write the name for you, and you can type it maybe later if you mm. are eating. It's not for everybody, but. Especially the worms. <laughs> right, right. So marcio means spoiled, gone. Um, but this is it, for maggio marcio. I think it has also a dialect name. If Nina was on this uh, thing, I was going to ask her to help because she has a home in Sardinia, pretty much is her second house. But yeah, anyway, they do, they like that. Uh, so that would be kind of the food of, uh, uh, of um, Sardinia. And uh, going to Sicily, well, Sicily has an amazing variety of food again because I said how many different people had been conquered the island. Yes, Randy? Well, I was just going to yeah. say, yeah, this is Randy. I just want to thank our friends from Dow Vineyards who joined. Oh, um, love Daniel and George and the team up there in Paso Robles. We feature their wines across our wine list. Even in this lockdown period, we're doing it for to go. And when we open later this week, Dow is certainly featured. So um, thank, you. thank you, Dow, for joining our yeah. island of Sicily and Sardinia. Okay, so going back to the food from Sicily, uh, in terms of products that come from the island, very famous for uh, prickly pear, that we call fiki d'India, for uh, capers, possibly the best capers of all Italy come from the island of Salina, which is north, uh, northeast from the main island. Uh, and then um, couscous, we talked about the Arabs being there quite a bit, so you find a lot of areas where couscous is like everyday food. Food street, like arancini. I'm sure lots of you had had arancini, possibly even here at Salari, so those amazing rice balls, uh, risotto balls that can be made. The traditional one are the uh, ragu, so meat sauce, and then peas, mozzarella, and then you make the ball, you bread it, and you deep fry it. They can be small, they can be huge, and you find them everywhere, and you can just, uh, you, 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 uh, it, it's like, buying pizza by the, by the slice for Sicily. Uh, pasta alla norma, that we actually did a live not too long ago. So the pasta with the tomato and uh, cheese and um, eggplant. Uh, couscous e serie, of course, fish and seafood. And then when you go to dessert, don't ever forget the beautiful granita, 
in many, many different flavors that you can have in Sicily, and cassata, the ricotta-based uh, cake, and of course cannoli siciliani. In terms of pairing these two wines, of course the pairing would be different, but the Vermentino, like other white wines that we did during this course, can definitely support pork. It's a beautiful pairing for a pork roast. Uh, but in other white meats, don't think about this white wine as your go-to wine just to eat fish and seafood. No, this is a wine that can definitely support uh, sturdier and heavier kind of dishes. As per the Nero Gibleo, also this one, possibly I would not pair it with light, I would not pair it with light seafood and fish, but uh, it could be paired with some heavier fish dish, like a, a fish soup, for example, tomato based, why not? Uh, also, it's a pretty easy drinking wine, right? Uh, very nice uh, uh, fruits aromas. To me, a little bit more plummy. I don't know if you guys are feeling the same. I mostly smell plum in it. And again, this might have to do with the vintage. There was a question about what are these vintages for people that didn't have a chance to get a kit and how long oh. would they last? The yeah, Giancara Vermentino 2018, I think this wine has, has um, three plus uh, years of life in it, honestly, and I'd be curious to see how it does in five plus. I think it can really age. It's actually a superiore that I mentioned earlier, which means that it has a higher alcohol um, content compared to the non superiore little brother. As per the Nerush Bleu, this one is a 2017, and I would give this one two, three, Years at that point, I'd say maybe he would be past his peak, and you know that because the tannins are already very silky and smooth, so there's not a lot of tanning structure. And and I think a little bit because of the heat and the drought of that year, it's not the acidity. It's it's there, but it's not as um, as alive, as fresh. So uh, without that many tannins, without a very big acidity structure, I'm not sure uh, if he can age. age uh, more than that, as per the single vineyards that they make, uh, those can age a long, long time. When I was there and um, have, was lucky enough to do a tasting with the, with the guy that was taking care of us at the winery in Chiaramonte, uh, we tried some very older, uh, old vintages of the single vineyard and they were just outstanding. Um, so, so yeah, it, it depends. This one being more of an everyday version of Nero Davola, I'd say, now it's 2020, this one was probably released in 2000, mid 2018, so about a year and a half after uh, the, the, the harvest. And I'd say drink now through 2023, that's what I would, that's what I would say. Then I didn't check what the, the, the critics online said, but you might find that they say something similar. What do you think? Do you like this Nero Davola? Did anybody of you um, had never had Nero Davola before? Curious to see if it was like a first for anybody out there. Okay, well, very good. Uh, I think, sorry for all the interruptions today, so I may have also lost a little bit track of my thoughts here and there, but I hope I was still able to give you some good information about the two islands, both places to visit. Now, avoid both places in the full, full summer. I'd say go to both Sardinia or Sicily between the months of April and June or between September and end of October. I think those would be the period where you would enjoy them the most, honestly. I was in Sicily end of October, mid to end of October. It was just gorgeous and perfect. Now, a lot of rain, but that is my fault. Wherever I go, I bring the rain. It just follows me like a little cloud. But um, if it wasn't for the rain, temperature was great and it was nice to be there in that period of the year. Now, I think we need to talk about what are we going to do next week. Well, we one thing, if I could just put you on the spot, we yeah. didn't rehearse this, but yeah. Sicily is also known for a fortified wine, Marsala. Yeah. Maybe yeah. just say a few words about that. Yes, I had it in my things, but I skipped it. So, yeah, Marsala, I think many of you are uh, familiar with that. It is the fortified wine, the most famous one produced uh, in Italy, and uh, it's produced in Sicily in the... In this area, so we are closer to uh, Trapani. You see Marsala here. So we are on the northwest part of the island. Taking the little map right up here. Okay? So the opposite of Mount Etna, pretty much. I'll show you where Mount Etna is. The opposite corner, if you look at Sicily as a reverse triangle, it's the opposite side, okay? 
And um, actually, Marsala production was not started by Italians. It was started by a British. Uh, in 1796, there was John Woodhouse that arrives to Marsala and say, I'm going to find a way how to make Madeira in Sicily for half the price. And there it started. Uh, so the production of uh, Marsala was actually started by uh, somebody from England. And since then, uh, they never stop. Uh, we talked about, uh, we did a little uh, gathering with uh, Randy, virtual gathering the other day, and we tasted Grillo, one of the native variety of Sicily, which means cricket, Grillo. Grillo is one of the main varieties used for the production of Marsala. In fact, Grillo is mostly grown in that same area. And until not too long ago, it was just used for the production of Marsala fortified wine. And everybody is familiar with what fortified means. Everyone assumes so. But if you don't know, it's just you, you start making your dessert wine from grapes, but then you add a certain amount of alcohol of different type, okay? Now, Marsala also has a very, very peculiar classification system. It's actually um, the only wine that is classified by sugar content, by aging, by color. Uh, so it has like a pyramid. If you type Marsala, I think you're going to find see this pyramid on Google too, where it tells you about all the different classification from the grapes that you use, if they're white or red, from how long is it aged, and then from the sugar content. Okay, so it's very, it's very interesting and definitely, definitely for those of you that normally think as Marsala as the cooking wine to make chicken Marsala, no, Marsala is much more than that. And you, you can get some amazing Marsala that are standalone drinking wines. For example, you should see how Marsala pairs with foie gras. Uh, we did that for one special dinner that we did with uh, Chef Suzette from Aquarelle in San Francisco. And we had a dish that had foie gras and white truffle and we paired it with Marsala. And it was just, uh, it was like a match made in heaven. So. Uh, don't think about Marsala again just as cooking wine or as a dessert wine, but it can actually play a very, very fun role in a lot of fun pairings. Something else that I may have forgot about this, there's so much to say, guys, we could, it's like Piemonte. People may say that from a wine point of view, Sicily, there's less to talk. No, you possibly can do a week, uh, two hour classes a day just talking about Sicily or just talking about Mount Etna, for example. So it's, it's, it's a lot. Well, let me tell you.